had like a bunch of people who were talking to me before we got here. But Billy Camp is here with us from Montgomery. He is the college minister uh, at Dalrada Church of Christ in Montgomery. Um, I got to spend some time with him while I was down there. I went to Dalrada. Uh, <laughs> what can I say about Billy except that he's an awesome guy? Um, he is a great friend. Uh, he, he is a strong Christian brother. I really look up to him, and I'm really excited about uh, what he's going to bring for you guys tonight. Um, he is a teacher also at Faulkner, um, and so uh, he's really going to bring it to you tonight. So I'm super excited to hear from him, and I know that you guys are too, but I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Billy now. I know I've had a couple of opportunities to come here before and speak at, uh, whether it's a youth rally or just coming up here periodically. Um, I know you're familiar with Andrew Kingsley, and so it's good to have him back into Montgomery. I know he had I've been gone for a little while uh, from us, but I'm glad that he's back there so we get to work together conveniently. I, I love that, the fact that university where he's at and Dalreda, we get to work together, our college ministries. And so any of your students that have been down that way or if you visited, you know how important that is for Faulkner and Montgomery. And any time that you're in town, please let us know so we can have opportunity to to spend that time with you, introduce you to the school, and also uh, have a chance to get involved with a college ministry. And so uh, I enjoy having part of you down there, and as well, just any time that we get to run across each other. It, I, I've really made connections here to be able to call you family and to be able to spend time together. And so I'm excited about this opportunity to be here tonight, have my family with me as well, uh, my wife and my daughter. And uh, we were running right into town. We had made plans to leave. We had uh, a couple of obligations back at Montgomery, and we left about 1230 thinking, okay, I probably have enough time. I know we'll be cutting it close. But 75 was blocked, and we uh, had to take some detours, and it started raining, so everybody was trying to dodge the raindrop, so it made it even more difficult. So we finally rolled into here. But I'm excited about having this opportunity to speak with you tonight. Uh, and before we begin our lesson, uh, Please bow for a word of prayer with me. Let's pray together. Lord our God, we come before you and we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here together, knowing that we are a family in your name. Please be with us as we consider your word, as we study what you have to say to us. Help us to write it on our hearts so that we may share it with others. We thank you for Jesus and we pray all this to you in his name. Amen. So your goal this summer has been to dig into some of the deeper matters concerning the Word of God. I, I, I looked over some of your topics that you're going to be looking at in the coming weeks especially. You're going to be hitting some very important topics that I think is going to push you in your personal faith uh, and your interactions with other people to really consider how to take the Word of God, what is God saying uh, to us, and how do we apply it to our lives and also to the lives of the people around us. And some of those things are going to require a lot of personal work. You know, I think, there's, I think it's very when you look at certain topics in the Bible, sometimes we take them for granted. You know, there are certain uh, topics we look at and we think, you know, I have a pretty good grasp of that. But it's really when we get in a conversation with someone else where you maybe get pinned uh, against the wall or you get backed into a corner and, or maybe you see something from a different angle that you hadn't considered before. And I think that's what's fascinating about every conversation we have with people that it allows us to sharpen ourselves, to, to see things differently, maybe see ourselves a little bit differently. And so I'm going to challenge you as you look at these topics this summer, any time that you decided to open up the Word of God and consider what it says, that you will really hone in on what is God trying to tell us. You know, put yourself to the side, put your preconceived notions, and really just focus on what God has to say. And I say that to build on to the case of what we're going to study tonight. Our topic is going to be moving from milk to meat. Now, there's two main passages that we're going to look at, uh, but the one predominantly we're going to spend a lot of our time in tonight is in Hebrews chapter 5. So if you have your Bibles, if you're going to follow along there, please go to Hebrews chapter 5. Now, to give you a little bit of background uh, on the book of Hebrews, if you haven't studied it recently in its entirety, I love the book of Hebrews. It's very systematic. Uh, there is an argumentation as you go through it, this writer, whoever he is, and I know a lot of people have postulated, you know, was it Paul, is it Luke, is it a companion? Whatever the case is, the guy's highly educated. Whoever is writing this book has been given a lot of information, and what they are concerned about is taking the word of God to the Jews. 
specifically to these Jewish people that really need to think about Jesus as he connects from the Old Testament into the New. Some of my favorite verses are the first four verses of Hebrews chapter 1. What he says here is that, look, you're familiar with how God operates. Long ago, in many different ways, God spoke to us through our fathers, uh, through, our, through his representatives, through the prophets. He spoke to them, they relayed that information to us. But now, in the time that we have, Jesus, the Son of God, has stepped onto the scene and God has spoken to us directly from his Son. He sent that representative, and that's the word that we have. We have the word of Christ. We have uh, the life of Christ. We see it being played out, the very embodiment of God's word being enshrouded in flesh, according to John chapter 1, and lived among us. Essentially, what God has shown us, he has given us a perfect example that you can take the word of God and you can live it out. You can actually do it. He's given us an example so that we may walk in the steps of Jesus. So the Hebrew writer opens up in Hebrews chapter 1 and tells us, look, you have the word of God lived out in front of you. You had Jesus. Even if you didn't see him, it's okay. You have evidences about him. In Hebrews chapter 2, it tells us that, that this message that the Hebrew writer received, he received from others that heard it directly from the Lord. And it was confirmed by signs and miracles and the mighty powers of God. As you start transitioning from Jesus into the time of the church, you see the word of God not just being preached, but being confirmed. You know, I love certain stories about Jesus that you get to see this where he doesn't only heal somebody, but he also teaches them something theologically. He approaches someone and he says, your sins are forgiven. And and people get on to him and they say, okay, Jesus, who are you to say that my sins are forgiven or this man's sins are forgiven? Who are you to think you can do that? well, what if I cause this man to to rise up and walk? Would you consider that I may have some power to to be able to do something like that? Rise up and walk and your sins are forgiven. Jesus was able to confirm what he said along with the things that he did. And that same pattern was then passed on to the apostles. You think about Acts chapter 2 when they stand up and they preach to thousands of people in various languages that were given to them uh, by the Holy Spirit. And you see thousands of people coming to a realization that they had crucified Christ, maybe not with their own hands, but because of their sins. But what they said were then backed with God's mighty hand. And here we are 2,000 years down the road from that similar pattern, and we think, okay, well, we have God's word. Can we really rely on it? Well, you know, it, we don't really have all these miracles to confirm, to confirm it in front of us, so what does that really mean? Well, what the Hebrew writer continues on from Hebrews chapter 2 and onward is that he essentially is saying, you can connect the dots. He's not left us abandoned and said, good luck with life. You know, I created you, I put you on this earth, there's no real rules, there's no regulations. If, you know, you want to come up with something, that's okay. Now, that's not how God operates. God has provided for us over and over again, and that's the story of the Bible from Genesis to where we are today, that God has put certain things into place so that we can know exactly what he wants and what he desires out of our lives. And what the Hebrew writer is telling us said, you have all the information you need to connect the dots to do what you need to do. From this point on, the Hebrew writer is going to dig deeper into some of these prophecies concerning Jesus. Specifically, as we are coming to Hebrews chapter 5, he's going to be dealing with something very important, that how does Jesus line up as a priest? How is it that Jesus says, I can offer myself for your sins, taking on the, the lamb, that role, also being able to be the high priest, the one that intercedes for us. The Hebrew writer connects the the priestly order of Melchizedek. If you go all the way back to the story of Abraham where he first comes on the scene, that's where Jesus gets his priesthood. And as the Hebrew writer is laying this out saying, okay, this is how you can connect Jesus as the high priest, he stops and he says in Hebrews chapter 5 verse 11, about this we have much to say. And it's hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. You know, I'm just wondering, and later on he's going to pick up in uh, chapter 7, and he'll continue talking about these things, but I'm wondering, as this Hebrew writer was revealing this, I wonder what he was going to say. I wonder how deep he was going to get into it, but he has to stop and he's like, okay, first we need to hear, you're not really ready for this. Because you've become dull of hearing. 
I want to stop and say that in the immediate context, he is writing to Jews. And so what we're going to do is we're going to connect some other passages in the Bible that's going to refer directly to the Jews, but I think you will see immediate application to our lives, maybe where we fall in line in similar ways to what he is a here. He looks at him, he says, look, we've got a lot to talk about. We've got a lot of things concerning the scriptures, but it's going to be hard to explain these things if you've become dull of hearing. Now, when you think about that term, dull of hearing, uh, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? You know, I think about people um, that, you know, have, the, have a hearing loss. Uh, my grandfather, he's in his 80s now. Uh, his hearing has gone down. When I go back home to visit him, and we're all sitting in the living room with a TV going, everybody having conversations, and I'm going to try and have a conversation with Paul. Paul. Usually we're both going to end up yelling at each other because we're going to be speaking over our, you know, other people. He can't hear very well. He'll, he'll, he'll hear something. I'll have to repeat it. You've seen those conversations. You might be on the receiving end of them. If someone has become dull of hearing, you know, you think about someone that just can't hear very well. Uh, but what I think the Hebrew writer is showing us here, someone that has actively tuned off. They've stepped back and they just, I don't, I don't really want to hear this right now. The story that I think of is found in John chapter 12. I think this just sets the scene for exactly what the Hebrew writer is dealing with. In John chapter 12, uh, starting around verse 36, Jesus has been trying to tell this group of people, look, it's time for me to leave. The Son of Man is going to be lifted up. He's going to go through many different things. He's going to suffer. And you read in verse 36, it says, When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. So that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who's delivered what he's heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe. For again, Isaiah said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart, and turn and I would heal them. Now, you may think, all right, this is kind of a, a weird passage to connect in its immediate context with Jesus, but also, why are we going here from Hebrews chapter 5? What's happening? If you look here, Jesus is trying to address these people that they're just not connecting the dots. He's doing the signs in front of them. He, he's showing them all, this, all these things to say, look, you need to pay attention to what I'm saying because I have the power of God. I have the word of God right here in front of you. You need to listen to these things. And over and over again, John says these people couldn't believe it. They didn't want to believe it. And he mentions that first passage, and if you're familiar, that's going to come from Isaiah chapter 53, the suffering servant passage. The suffering servant is going to appear on the scene as a root out of dry ground, and people are going to look at him and they're not going to accept him. They're actually going to put him through trials. They're going to make him suffer, and he's going to bear the weight of other people's sins. But what he's saying is, look, the arm of the Lord has been revealed. They had everything they needed to know to follow God's word, but they rejected it. The next part that he's going to look at is that their eyes have been blinded. They can't understand, that they can't connect it. You, know, you think about Jesus saying, he who has ears, let him hear. When Jesus is saying these things, what he's telling them is, are you actually willing to receive this? When we become dull of hearing, it's when we start turning things off and we just say, look, I, I'm, not really, I'm, I'm really not ready to connect the dots. It, it kind of, it, a bit of, a, of ex, expectation out of me. God, you're asking a little bit much. This conflicts with what I've been doing the past number of years of my life. This conflicts with what I think God wants out of my life or what I've studied, it, you know, maybe through other people or whatever the case may be. This is what I think of when the, the Hebrew writer is connecting these things. But then I continue to look at John chapter 12, verse 41. Listen to what he says. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him, of course, concerning God. Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. When I think about someone that has become dull of hearing, it's when they have put themselves as priority number one instead of God. In case you missed it, the Jews believed but refused to follow. 
You know, there's times where we may read a passage, we may read something that, that God has given to us, and we think, I know for a fact this is conflicting with my life, and I know exactly what God's trying to tell me to do. I'm just not ready for it yet. When we're studying this topic and we're thinking about moving from milk to meat, moving from some of the basic principles onto higher things, better things about Christianity, we really need to stop and evaluate our personal faith in God. How willing are we to listen to God's word and make the necessary changes? That's something that we each individually have to ask. And for us to consider how to move from milk to meat, we have to start at this point. Are you willing at every juncture of your life to consider the word of God and say, God, you're in control, your will be done, not mine? That's when we start paying attention, and that's when we're ready. So let's go back to Hebrews chapter 5. So he stops and he tells them, look, there's a lot that we could be talking about, but you've become dull of hearing. Verse 12, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. Now what does he mean here that you ought to be teachers by now? I think it's obvious that God expects a lot out of his creation. I don't know how adamant you are about earning the title of teacher. There's a lot of responsibility being a teacher. Now, I assume probably in this room we have some teachers, people who have retired from teaching or are currently in that position, whether it's from you know, little kids all the way up to high school, college, whatever that may be. You understand the role of a teacher. There's a lot of responsibility. Coming up with lesson plans, making sure that you are well aware of the information you need to present to somebody. You know, I've heard over and over again, if you really want to be able to understand a topic, teach it. If you can take a topic and convey it to someone else, then you really have grasped it. The Hebrew writer's telling them, he said, hey, look, at this point, you ought to be teachers. You should know these things so well that you're able to convey it to somebody else. But let's be honest, being a teacher is intimidating. Remember that time where we talked earlier about that time maybe where you got pressed against the wall in a dialogue with somebody? Maybe somebody pressed you about why you were a Christian or why you worship in a certain way or why you believe in a certain way. You get pressed against the wall and you think, I don't really know how to respond to this. Maybe you just shut down. Maybe you get angry. Maybe you just start speaking and you, you step back later and you say, man, I shouldn't have said that. Or, oh man, I, I wish I would have said that to them. Teaching or instructing somebody is challenging. But I think what the, the writer is telling us here, and it's obvious just in a normal Christian life, is that if we really understand the Word of God, we need to be telling people. Now, that may come out in a lot of different capacities. Somebody may see the, the need of stand, <clears throat> standing up and being a preacher, or maybe a Bible class teacher, or maybe something as simple as getting a group of friends together, or co-workers during lunch, and reading the Scripture together and talking about it. Maybe it's you sitting down with your immediate family each night or each morning and reading a few passages and talking about them together. You see, the role of a teacher is going to come out in a lot of different venues. It's maybe not as formal as we would expect, but it's at any point. And for us to be teachers, we really need to understand what God is telling us so that we may tell other people. But if we don't understand the basic oracles of God... It's going to be hard for us to talk about anything deeper. And so we ask, okay, what do you consider to be the basics? If we were going to take a poll and we were going to look across this room, what do you consider to be the very basic elementary principles of the Word of God? Can you say all the books of the Bible? <laughs> you know, can you, can you name the 12 tribes? What about the plagues? Can you roll those off? What about the apostles? Can you give a, a basic, you know, outline to the story of Jesus? You know, what would you consider to be some of those basic principles about God's word? Is it just saying, you know, uh, God created the heavens and the earth in six literal days and he rested on the seventh? Or there was a flood and, and, you know, Noah built this ark and he carried all the animals on there. Is that what we consider to be the basic oracles? 
What exactly does that mean? Now, the Hebrew writer is going to tell us in just a minute what those are and how we can move past them. But hold that in your mind. What do you consider to be those basic things? He goes on and he says uh, at the end of verse 12, You need milk and not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. Now, for those of you that have raised children, that transition where you start going from, you know, milk to solid food. Uh, You know, before I became a parent, looking back on, you know, looking down the road of, okay, that would seem like an easy transition, right? Like, it just makes sense that you're going to go from milk and you'll start adding certain things. I don't think that we're going to be the only ones that have experienced this, but for those of you that have raised children and you've gone through that, that's a really scary time where you start introducing solid food because you're teaching a child to be able to chew properly and not choke. Do you remember the first time that your child was eating something a little more solid than milk and they started choking on it? Oh, man, you will run into the kitchen as quick as you can, you know, pick them up. You'll do whatever you can because they just weren't ready for it yet. Uh, That was really intimidating to me. But then the more it happens, the better they get. And then you go on from there. And now they can eat just about anything. I think about that transition. I've got a one and a half year old. And I think about her learning how to eat. It was necessary for her to go through the challenge of transitioning from liquid to substance. And it's not always an easy transition, is it? You look back and you think, well, it just makes sense, but this is completely new for someone. Now, I think this is a very strong illustration the Hebrew writer is trying to reveal to us. He says, look, you need milk. You've got to go back to that. You're not really ready to chew on these things yet. You're going to choke a little bit. You're you're not going to be able to digest. You're not going to be able to handle it. We've got to go back. We've got to teach these basic things so you can learn, so you can grow up and handle what you need to. And so he begins and he says, For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. Now that word righteousness is a technical term. Uh, Anytime you see in the New Testament or anywhere in the Bible, uh, righteousness, just, justifiable, um, right, anything associated with those, there's a center root word to all of it. Uh, It's almost like a court case. Uh, You you see a person that stands before a judge, and, and the judge is going to make a call based on the evidence, whether he is guilty or he is innocent. If someone is found innocent, they are found justified. They're found in the right, set apart from the other things. When he's speaking of someone moving from milk to meat, he's saying that those who live on milk are unskilled in the word of righteousness. When I think about the word of righteousness, I think about God telling us, here's the things you need to live the right kind of life. Here's the things you need to look like Jesus. Someone that is unskilled in the words of righteousness are missing some vital components to look like Jesus. Furthermore, he says, since he is a child. You know, no one likes being called a child. It doesn't matter how old you are if someone says you're acting like a child. You may take that as a compliment. I don't know. But really, you know, down in our heart, we we don't want to be called children. We don't want to be called children of anything. If you're acting like a child, you have digressed. You've gone back to where you have been before, and you need to go on from there. Someone that's unskilled in the word of righteousness, you don't know how to grow up and act like a mature Jesus. You've gone back to the very basic, small points of life. But in verse 14, but solid food is for the mature. For those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. If you're going to underline any verse, you're going to make a notation in your Bible if you do that, I would highly encourage you to make a note to verse 14. Listen to what he says one more time. For those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. All right, so let's continue using our illustration of a child. Not just in relation to learning how to eat, but let's say that we are training our children to make good and right choices. Think about you training your child at a very young age. You want them to make the right decisions, whatever that may be. 
it takes correction. You don't want them to touch certain things. You don't want them to go somewhere. You don't want them to do this. You don't want them to do that. You have to steer them and direct them using discipline for them to make the right decisions. You want to train them under constant practice to be able to do that. Now, for us who are mature, we should, at this point in our lives, be able to discern between good and evil. But how do you know what is good and what is evil? Is it arbitrary? Do we just get to say, you know what, that just, it gives me a weird feeling. It must not be good. Or, you know, this is really, really important for my life. It must be good. God must have done something and put it there. How do you discern between what is good and what is evil? Now, I think it's important, as we look at this as well, it's not just saying what is sinful and what is not. I think about the Hebrew writer. I think about works of wisdom. I think there's a lot of wisdom in what you read here, but if you go back to the book of Proverbs, if you've made any practice to study the book of Proverbs, you learn as you read line by line, a challenge after challenge. And a lot of the words that you find in the book of Proverbs shape you to be just a better overall person. Some of the decisions that we make in life, where we're going to go, what we're going to do, don't necessarily always deal with what is sinful and what is not. There's a lot of times where we are approached with a situation in life where we stand at a, a crossroad and we have to decide, is this going to be profitable? Is this going to be good? Is there things that I can do here to bring glory and honor to God? Or is this going to lead me somewhere I don't need to go? Is this going to be the first stop to somewhere I don't need to be? When I think about good and evil, when I think about right and wrong, when I think about sinful and, and, and those things that are approved, we have to be able to draw a distinction for what looks the most like Jesus and what will take me further from God. If we become dull of hearing, we're going to stand at the crossroads, we're going to stand at the fork, and we're not going to know which way to go because there may not be that much of a difference between them. But someone who has made a constant practice to discern between good and evil, you will stand at a crossroad, you'll stand at a fork, and you will clearly see, I strongly believe, a way that is good and a way that is evil. Maybe at times it manifests itself a little bit further down. But there's a certain mentality that is attached to it that I think the Hebrew writer is trying to put into our minds of, can you think like Jesus? Go back to that phrase, those that are unskilled in the word of righteousness. Think back in some of the, the strongest points of your faith, where, where you felt like all things were just working together. You know, you think about some of the phrases we use, have this mind among yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, or take every thought captive to obey Christ. When Maybe certain points in your walk of faith that you knew that you were thinking in sync with what God really has designed for you. You can just see life completely different. Now think about some of the worst points in your life. Think about some of the decisions that you made where you knew it did not look anything like God. You know that you had walked down a path that was not intended for you at all. And you knew it before you even took your first step. We look back on those moments and we think, if I would have had the right decision beforehand, I feel like I would have been better. I think that's what the Hebrew writer is trying to tell us here. He's trying to tell us, can you prepare yourself right now for when those challenges approach that you're ready and you're skilled and you're prepared? This is the process of moving from milk to meat, advancing, going closer and closer to God. For us, the chapter ends here. But the thought doesn't stop. We have to pick up in chapter 6, starting in verse 1. I want you to pay very close attention to this next part. Therefore, speaking of these things, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity. Okay, so anytime, as you know this, as you study, anytime you see the word therefore, I had a teacher that always told me, he said, you have to ask the question, what is it there for? You look back. What has he told us that's going to bring us to where we are now? He says, therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrines of Christ. Now, those are heavy terms. 
When we think about elementary, we think about going and learning the, you know, the basics of math and English, you know, so that later on you can be prepared to receive higher things. Elementary doctrines of Christ. Uh, maybe your translation has teachings of Christ. If you see the word doctrine, teaching, those are going to be interchangeable. Leaving the elementary teachings of Christ. Okay, let's stop and ask our question again as we went back and we thought, okay, what, what are the basics? What would you consider to be some of the basics teachings of Jesus? Love your neighbor as yourself. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Um, you know, be a, a light to the world. Be the salt. You know, you look at some of those things and we think, okay, those are, you know, basic teachings about, you know, Christ. These are the basic doctrines. But pay attention to what he's about to call the basics. Not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works. So right out of the gate, he's going to say, okay, let's move past dealing with repentance. Man, that's a lot of Jesus' teachings. You know, he tells us how to direct ourselves, how to be better. Don't go here. Don't do this. Don't do this. Do this. Do this. Repentance is a change of mind, a change of heart, a change of action, where we see ourselves differently, where we want to go somewhere else. Many of Jesus' teachings have to deal with repentance. You die to yourself so that you can walk with Christ. You take up the cross so that you can go with him. You die, you, you lay your life to the side so that you can look like him. Not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works. Man, every day we're dealing with that though, right? You woke up today or maybe you reflect back on your day and you think, man, there's a lot of things I maybe need to repent of. Or there was a, a glaring obvious one that happened today that I need to change from. The Hebrew writer is calling that a, a basic elementary teaching of Jesus. It's one of the hardest ones to implement. Or maybe look in verse 2, and instructions about washings. Now, the ESV uses washings. I know there's different ways to, to translate it out there. The, the term that is behind it has to deal with baptism. I'm, co- I'm confident and I'm comfortable with saying that he's referring to, whether you want to call it a ritual washing or you just want to use the term baptism, If you want to go as basic as possible or as deep as you want to in that, I think he has to deal with moving sin, moving what is unclean, and going on to what is clean. I think about the purity laws of the Old Testament. God telling people, don't eat that. Don't touch that. Clean yourself in this way. Do this, do this. You transition from one style of life to another. That goes hand in hand with repentance. You change from the old man to a new man. That's an elementary principle. Learning about baptism, learning about that transitional point. Furthermore, he says the laying on of hands. Okay, now we're getting something where even more. We're still having debates about the laying on of the apostles' hands or laying on of them as they they pray with somebody. We'll talk about the the gifts of the Holy Spirit and what does that really mean. They're looking back on this and saying, that's an elementary principle. You should go beyond this. I just last week, I was having a lectureship with some people, and, and we were talking about these very things, and, and the, the room kind of lit up a little bit with all these different perspectives. Yet the Hebrew writer tells us, look, you should have figured that out a long time ago. You should have figured out these are elementary principles. Now, I think there is a path you can take with Hebrews chapter 2 that he's telling us those things are no longer necessary. We don't need to talk about the laying on the apostles' hands, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, because you have what has been confirmed. You don't need those things. Let's put that to the side. Let's actually just focus on what is said and not what we want to have said. Furthermore, he says, the resurrection of the dead. Look, if Jesus has been raised from the dead, then you too should walk in the newness of life, and you too should be looking for heaven afterwards. But man, how many, how many debates could we get into? What does the resurrection body look like? <laughs> you know, 1 Corinthians 15, if you read that recently... There's a lot of things going on there about the resurrection of the dead. What happens when we're raised? How long of a a time span is there before we go to be with Christ? We still get into these debates, but the Hebrew writer is saying, look, it's time to go past that. Look, you know that resurrection is going to happen. Jesus is already done. He says, I'm coming back for you. Read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and chapter 5. You're going to be raised from the dead. Let's go beyond these things. And eternal judgment. 
we should have enough confidence in our life to say that when my life is over, I know I'll be in heaven. The, many of the writers of the New Testament say things uh, sort of uh, akin to, I write these things that you may have faith. I write these things that you may know that you have eternal life. What has been revealed to us is to assure us, give us a confidence that we have a home in heaven waiting for us. That when we stand before God, we can have confidence that what he has told us, if we obey it, we will be with him. How many times in our lives do we question things like that of, I just don't know if I'm, if I were to die right now, I just don't know if I'd be in heaven. Now, I understand these things are heavy, and I understand that it takes a lot of work. And I don't think the Hebrew writer is saying, you know, he's not saying you're just going to learn these things overnight. That is that process of learning how to eat. You have to digest it. You have to work with it. You have to challenge yourself, and you get hung up on it at times. But when you really get a grasp of it, there will, th- there will be things that start opening up around you. You'll start seeing life differently. You'll start seeing God differently. This is what he calls those basic principles. But look at verse 4. And this is where the self-reflection comes in. And I want you to bear with this thought all the way out, but I don't want you to get hung up on it. In verse 4, he says, well, in verse 3, he says, And this we will do if God permits. So moving past the, the basics. But in verse 4, For it's impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away. Now connect our term from above. I'm reading from ESV. What he's saying in verse 4, For it's impossible if they fall away to restore them again to repentance. They are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own arm and holding him up to contempt. Now you may read this and you say, okay, did the Hebrew writer just say it's impossible to restore again to repentance after you've fallen away? Now, we know that's not the case. We study the whole counsel of God and we understand these things. But what is the Hebrew writer telling us here? Why is he using such strong language that if, I mean, he, he's pretty much telling someone that has been in a saved relationship with God. He's saying if you have learned all these things, you've tasted all the, the heavenly gifts, you have understood God, if you turn from them, it's going to be impossible to restore you again to repentance. Why is that? I think what he's trying to visualize for us, and this goes back, I believe, to become dull of hearing, in the case that he's making towards the Jews. The Jews had so many positive advantages in their life to know God. You can go and do a word search through this whole passage and and relate all these terms over to the Jews. That term, the oracles of God, Paul uses that to describe the Jews in Romans chapter 3 and tells them they were given the basic oracles of God and they refused to do them. If anyone had an upper leg, if anybody had an upper hand to to be able to do something for God, to see him for who he really is, that would be the Jews. The Jews had everything they needed, but you find what we saw in John chapter 12, they refused to follow. How is it that someone had all of these things, they knew exactly what God expected, and they didn't follow him? How is that possible? How is it that they would believe in God and they wouldn't actually draw near to him. That's where we have to make the reflection in our personal lives. If God tells us something, if we do exactly what he tells us to do, are we willing to make the changes possible? That's what this has to mean, moving from the milk to the meat. Moving from becoming a Christian to actually living and functioning completely like Christ. Now, I told you that there's another time where this milk and meat uh, illustration is used, and it's over in uh, 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 1. I want you to connect these thoughts together and see what uh, Peter's going to tell them. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, he says, Put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, 
Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that, is by, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. It's time to grow up. It's time to take those teachings and not just be able to answer them on a quiz, to be able to, to say, oh, I know what repentance is. I can give you a definition. I know what eternal judgment is. I, I know that there's not this you know, millennial reign. I know that there's not this and not this and not this. We need to have a grasp of those things, but really it's having a grasp so that we can live it out. That's when you will see maturity. When you start thinking like Christ, being able to discern between good and evil, that's the goal. That's what God is challenging us to do so that we see everything so different. Just today, um, we celebrated the life of uh, one of the members of our congregation. Uh, he had passed away unexpectedly, a, a terrible, tragic accident. Uh, 74 years old, uh, been married 55 years. The, the church building w- was filled this morning as we honored him and thought about his life. But one of the things I was thinking about as I was uh, there with the family and watching them is they had a peace about them. Something so tragic of him losing his life so quickly today, uh, the, over the, the weekend as they think about it today. They had a peace. I don't think it was just a peace of knowing that, oh, he was a good man and he, he's going to be in heaven or this or this, but a peace that... I can trust in God regardless of what is in front of me. If I will put God first, all the tragedies and trials may happen. I'm just going to look towards heaven and think like God. I think that's when you will start seeing maturity in your Christian life. When no longer will you consider the powers of the world... No longer will you consider yourself as anything, but you'll count all things as rubbish in comparison to Christ. When you will take up the charge to think like Jesus, to be like Jesus, so that you will truly be a light to the world and salt of the earth. My challenge for you as you continue these studies on Wednesday night is anytime you consider the word of God, is not just be able to answer the question, but to be able to live it out in your personal life. That's when you will really understand what maturity is, when you become like Christ. Hope you'll consider these things, go back and study these passages, and try and implement them and write them on your heart. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you tonight, uh, to, to be here and to worship with you, and also to be able to study. Uh, as we finish our lesson, let's have a word of prayer. Oh Lord God, we come before you tonight thanking you for your word that you have given to us. The same word that you spoke from long ago that you have revealed through time and eventually as, as you took that word and put it into flesh and let it live out in front of us, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you for presenting him as the ultimate example for what a mature person needs to look like. Father, help us to sharpen our, our skills of discernment so that we can choose good over evil and help us to be able to see what is good and what is evil. We thank you for laying that path before us. Thank you for giving us your word so that we are not left abandoned, but we are prepped and prepared so that when uh, we face trials, that we're ready to think like you. Father, be with us until uh, we get to be in heaven with you one day. But until then, help us to work and teach and do everything we can to bring ourselves as well as others to your word and under submission of your Son. Be with us this night and the rest of our lives. We thank you for Jesus, and we pray all this to you in his name. Amen.